from the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles, this is Uprising and I'm Sonali Gohatkar. It's Friday, December 12th, 2014. Tales of the Grim Sleeper, a new highly acclaimed documentary by Nick Broomfield, delves deep into a little-known story of how a serial killer terrorized a community in South LA for decades. It's a story of police apathy, poverty, the drug war, misogyny, and the brave activism of ordinary citizens. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Christina Mislan. She is an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Hi, Christina. Hello, Sonali. CIA Director John O'Brennan has finally spoken out about the Senate Intelligence Committee report on the torture of post-9-11 war prisoners. Addressing the press yesterday, the embattled agency head vehemently defended a program that included letting prisoners freeze to death, violating their bodies and what amounted to rape, threatening to kill their loved ones, and wrongfully imprisoning people who have no connection to terrorism or crime. Mr. Brennan insisted CIA officers were, quote, patriots. He denounced the report as flawed, partisan, and frustrating. Former President George H.W. Bush also came to the defense of an agency he had once directed, saying CIA officers were, quote, unheralded, selfless, and the very finest people. People. He made no mention of his own son, George W. Bush's role as president overseeing the CIA during its torture program. Christina, how interesting has it been for you to see these various U.S. leaders justify this torture uh, and, this, and the rape and the killing with such defiance? You know, part of me, you know, I tell myself that I shouldn't be surprised. Um, and by telling myself I shouldn't be surprised, that would actually allow me to see that these are really just comments of um, people who want, whose interests are at stake or at stake and whose interests are more important than the question about human rights, at least in their eyes. But what we're seeing here, what I believe what we're seeing is a system not only not only continues to protect itself, but one that is far removed from the U.S. American public. And I think about all of the Hollywood films I've recently seen on um, particularly political thrillers, when they usually get dismissed as um, kind of conspiracy theories. But um, one of the things that Noam Chomsky tells us is that these so-called conspiracy theories are not conspiratorial at all. Um, so these stories that we see on film and on screen are actually happening, and U.S. actions continue to show that um, to us over and over again, that these aren't conspiracies at all. These are actually things that happen, and we should not be surprised. Not everyone in Washington, D.C. lacks a conscience. A major walkout yesterday afternoon by black congressional staffers in the nation's capital made a strong statement against police violence aimed at African Americans. More than 100 staffers gathered on the steps of the U.S. Capitol building to add their voices to the growing ranks of protesters around the U.S. On the other side of the U.S., Richmond, California's police chief, Chris Magnus, made news when he joined protesters and held a sign saying, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Chief Magnus told press it was important for police to be, quote, protecting people's constitutional rights. Under his unusual approach to policing that actually involves working with the community, crime rates have dramatically dropped. Meanwhile, in Ferguson, Missouri, the epicenter of anti-police brutality protests, activists won a major victory in court this week against the indiscriminate use of tear gas by police. Christina, you're in Missouri. How has Ferguson changed the national conversation on police brutality? You know, right now, Ferguson is, is a fascinating point of conversation, but it's also a site of resistance. And one of the things that I think um, is really changing our conversation about issues like police brutality is how that resistance is actually happening. So I was able to join last week's um, NAACP marchers to the Capitol in Jeff City. And with the union of NAACP marchers and younger Ferguson protesters, I was able to see an, a conversation that emerged that really questioned um, what we are suggesting as solutions. So for instance, the idea that voting would be some sort of um, kind of all-encompassing solution or using cameras. And what we're seeing over and over is that these are not um, solutions that are going to completely 
eliminate police brutality, right? And as one person said at, in that conversation, we've been voting for 50, 60 years, but not much has changed. Right. So I think that's part of the national conversation. What are these solutions? And then finally, the Justice Department yesterday announced it would no longer pursue cases of pot cultivation or sales conducted on Native American reservations, even in cases where it is illegal in the state that the reservation is on. In addition to being a victory for marijuana legalization, the move also underscores the fact that indigenous communities have sovereign lands. It was a fact seemingly lost on Arizona's Republican Representative Paul Gosar, who at a recent town hall meeting referred to Native Americans as, quote, wards of the state. The phrase offended tribal leaders, including Phil Stago, of the White Mountain Apache tribe, who said he kind of revealed the true deep feeling of the federal government. Tribes, you can call yourselves sovereign nations, but when it comes down to the final test, you're not really sovereign, end of quote. Representative Gosar has yet to retract his statement, and one of his fellow Republicans lashed out at the fact that people found it offensive, saying that Stago's statement amounted to race baiting. Christina, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, and that comment won't be retracted. And so we shouldn't at all be surprised that yet again, another white politician accuses a non-white person of race baiting. It's one of the most annoying things ever. But um, the conversation here really is reflective of this historical legacy in this country, which is to deny indigenous communities real sovereignty. And really, this is an issue that extends way beyond U.S. borders. It's, there's a global movement right now. I'm both on um, the part of multinational corporations, um, including oil industry and indigenous communities who wish to preserve their lands and their livelihoods. So the real issue has nothing at all to do with the race baiting, but it's a conversation about the ability for native communities to protect their land and that land that's being pillaged by these multinational corporations. Christina, always a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Christina Mislein is an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. This is Uprising. We'll be right back. This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Los Angeles in the 1980s and 90s was an epic epicenter of violence and drugs. The worst impacted part of the city was South LA, where a spate of murders of mostly young black women went unsolved for decades. And then, nearly four years ago, a man by the name of Lonnie Franklin Jr. was arrested in connection to the murders of a number of women who were shot with a 25 millimeter gun. Franklin was picked up after DNA from one of his relatives linked him to saliva on the bodies of victims. The women aged 14 to 36 were only a small number of women who are still missing, some of them sex workers. The story of the murders, the man who have, may, may have been behind them, and the city where it all happened forms the basis of a new documentary called Tales of the Grim Sleeper by Nick Broomfield. Named by journalists following the story, the Grim Sleeper was so named because it was thought that the killer took a break of 13 to 14 years from killing before starting up again in 2002. Tales of the Grim Sleeper has been picked up by HBO Documentaries. It's been shortlisted for the Academy Awards Best Documentary nominations, and it opens on the big screen for a one-week run at the Lemley Playhouse in Pasadena, Southern California, through next Wednesday. Eventually, will air on HBO. Joining me in studio today is Nick Broomfield, award-winning filmmaker. His earlier films include Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, and Sarah Palin, You Betcha. And Margaret Prescott, founder of the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders. She's also a familiar voice to our KPFK listeners. She's the host of Sojourner Truth, airing at 7 a.m. Uh, welcome to Uprising, Margaret and Nick. Hi. Good to be here, Sivali. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I have to say the movie was um, incredibly amazing, incredibly disturbing. I had a hard time sleeping last night after I watched it. Um, and the most incredible part about it was that people outside of L.A. and even probably most people in L.A. haven't known that this is a story that took place right here. Um, first, uh, I'd like to start, Margaret, with you, since you've been involved in the story for many, many years. And we know that um, many women were have gone missing, but this person who's now been arrested four years ago has only been arrested in connection with the murders of a handful of women. How serious is, has this issue been? It's been very serious because I think anyone watching this program, listening to this program, would know and recognize very well that if it was one young white West Virginia student that goes missing, it's on the news every day, the whole world knows about it. 
but to have scores of black women in South LA to be killed, to be victims of a serial killer, and a lot of people in South LA don't even know about it, much less the broader Southern California area, much less the nation or the world. It's the kind of devaluation of uh, the lives of black women that we connect very much with the mass movement that's happening now on the street about Black Lives Matter. When I founded the Black Coalition in the mid-1980s, our theme was every life is of value, black women's lives count. Right. Black women's lives so matter, very and much there you go. Similar, right, almost exactly the same theme. Yes. Uh, Nick, why did this story interest you, and, and how did you determine how to go about approaching it? Because you essentially, um, interviewed the uh, friends uh, of the person that people now believe is the grim sleeper, mm. Lonnie Franklin. Well, yeah. I've lived in Los Angeles a long time. When I first came here in the 70s, uh, the, the city actually was, m there was a lot more contact with South Central Los Angeles than today. Uh, there were much more federal funded programs. There, in fact, my mother-in-law had a medical center there. Uh, and there was a lot more toing and froing. I think the f federal funding all got cut off, then the crack went in, and I think what we have now is two cities. We have the sort of white, wealthy city, and you have South Central, and there's no communication between the two cities. So when I came across this case, and there were you know, inklings of maybe 200 women disappearing, which is a kind of mini genocide happening in mm -hmm. the center of Los Angeles, uh, I thought, how is this possible? So I went in with a very simple question, which was, how is it possible that this number of people could disappear inside the city? And of course, you know, and the film really is that investigation and that story. And you realize that the two cities have completely different value systems and completely different life expectations. And that's really, I think, the most devastating thing about the film because it's only 15 miles from where I live in Santa Monica that this is happening. And I think people in this city are so unaware of what is happening. And, you know, Margaret, for 25 years, has been pioneering this, trying to get an investigation. Even today, despite the fact that there are this number of people missing, that it took 25 years for the police to catch at uh, Lonnie Franklin, uh, there's still be no internal investigation. It, I mean, there should really be some kind of massive inquiry as to how right. this is possible to have happened. It's such a disgrace. Now, uh, Margaret, uh, let's talk about the fact that uh, there are about a dozen murders being pinned on Frank Franklin. His, uh, the name given to the serial mm -hmm. murderer was the Grim Sleeper because the people thought that for years, for over a decade, there were no murders being done. Do you believe that? A lot of people question that, and we're actually not sure. You know, by the end of 1989, the Black Coalition count, given reports we were getting from people in the community, their bodies were being dumped in schoolyards even, alleyways, etc. Our count was Sonali, 90 women. Mm. Now, we're not detectives. We couldn't verify that. We just kept the count, or if there was a little slither in the examiner, which I think is now defunct in, in um, Los Angeles, or in the LA Times, we would clip it, and we would really try to, to keep those counts. We would go out into the neighborhood, sometimes in the middle of the night, handing out, I think we've given out, gave out, a, a, during that period, about 150,000 flyers that these murders um, or, you know, were happening. So Lonnie Franklin right now, he's being charged, from what I understand, with 10 counts of murder, uh, one count of attempted murder, but they do have DNA evidence on him for at least another 10. But that's not the end of the story. Um, if, in fact, he's innocent until proven guilty, if, in fact, he is uh, guilty. We know that he had access to a dump site. He was employed in the sanitation department. He was employed by the police department. The police department, 77th Police Division. Right. And so, and, and meanwhile, the family members, and, and we can't forget the victims who've been so vilified in the press, called all kinds of names in and the And actually, press. I want to just uh, yeah. mention for a second, the, L the LAPD had this term, any chai, no human involved, and yeah. this was crimes involving drug addicts and, and sex workers That's who right. literally were considered not 
human. What role did that play in and them just ignoring this? We think it's it's criminal negligence, frankly speaking, and, and we issued a press release recently calling it as such. Because if you think about the fact that there was a 911 call um, where the body of Barbara Ware was found, um, her mother Diana Ware is actually in the mm. film. Um, the mother was never notified, by the way, by LAPD that her child was a victim of the serial killer. LAPD held on to that 911 call for 22 years. Also, the bullet in mm. uh, Anitra, um, who was a, Anitra a survivor, she that bullet was connected to other uh, murders. They knew it was a serial killer. They held on to that for 22 years. That is criminal neglect. And we talk right. about the, 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 the difference in, in culture. It really has to do with the culture within law enforcement that could come up with a term, no humans involved. And the devaluation of the lives of those women uh, but also the devaluation of those families, the lack of respect of even informing them in any decent way. Janissa, who is one of the vil victims, she has a son. He's now entering his teenage years. I mean, he has to deal with all of that. Right. Uh, her Laverne is trying to raise him with very, very little support. Right. So th there are lots of, this is not over. There needs to be an investigation. Yeah. Mm. As Nick mentioned, um, by the Department of Justice, we're hoping a congressional investigation because there is something wrong that this went on for so long and nothing or very little was done about it. Mm. Nick Broomfield, you delved deep into the community, and, and this is a story in your film told by members of the community. Uh, tell us about Pam Brooks. She knew Lonnie Franklin. She plays a prominent role in your film. You joked that uh, she was almost running your production at one point. Yeah. <laughs> She's well, great. I think I think that's kind of indicative, really, of what happens to, I mean, Pam, I think, is the most wonderful person. She's incredibly organized. She completely, you know, she was 100% reliable. She was diligent. She, she followed through on everything. She introduced you to so many people. Yeah. yeah, and so she was kind of a magnificent help to the production. I'm sure if Pam had been born in a diff different part of the city, she'd probably be running a corporation mm -hmm. or some company by now but you know as it is she has a problem making the rent at the end of every month and so we just happened to meet Pam by chance on one of the first days of filming she and my son who actually shot the film uh, Barney are really into playing backgammon so it was a very <laughs> natural kind of relationship and then we would be going off filming and Pam says sort of shall I come along and then of course Pam knew so many of the women who were homeless on the street or still working on the street. She'd been on the street for like 30 years herself. She knew Lonnie Franklin. She'd been with him a couple of times, you know, and was able to tell us more about... And in many know. ways felt that she avoided the fate that some of the well, women... Well, yes, she avoided... She was lucky, you yeah. know. Uh, and yeah. um, at the same time, knew a lot of the women and was able to... They trusted her... And, you know, she treated, obviously, the other woman with a lot of compassion right. and respect, having been through it herself. So she was invaluable. And you also spoke to friends of Lonnie Franklin. It was interesting to see their evolution through the film. These three friends of Lonnie Franklin, who initially did not believe he was the murderer, couldn't believe. They stuck, stuck up for him. They admitted that he dealt in stolen cars, but nothing else. Um, and everyone who knew him seemed to like him. But then they came back to you mm. in the course of the film and then told you things that just were so um, <laughs> obvious. Well, you know, that, that a, just, yeah, I mean, it I, just. <laughs> I mean, I think that, uh, as you said, Lonnie was very popular in the neighborhood. He was sort of like the local fence. If you wanted a cheap washing machine or TV, he'd get it for you. Uh, he also had a lot of money. He could employ people. And in an area of incredibly high unemployment, it was hard to sort of turn your back on Lonnie. At the same time, I think the process of making a film makes people much more, it makes them focus on themselves because you're asking them questions about themselves. And, and I think a number of the friends kind of had a kind of, were worried about their relationship with him. Well, they saw a lot of him. hints of very yeah, troubling things. And but I think they just sort of shunned them on. They just sort of got on with their lives and hadn't really taken it into account. And I think during the process of the film, they became quite introspective. And I think they became also quite remorseful. And their humanity came out. And I think they they 
wanted to distance themselves from what had taken yeah. place. Now, and around the, the time that the murders started, Margaret, the crack mm -hmm. cocaine explosion in L.A. took off, as we've mm -hmm. uh, briefly mentioned, that we now know the CIA's role in that well documented. Mm -hmm. Do you see these two things as connected, the murders in South L.A. and the drug epidemic? Absolutely. They began around the same time, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, looking at, at Lonnie's friends and at, at the community, we see a community that's been devastated. We see very, very high unemployment rates. We see very little uh, for young people to even do, even to go outside and play, uh, much less to be able to get some kind of income. We see the safety net shredded where single mothers, you know, can no longer get any access to resources. And, and you know, I've had young people say to me, you know what, I'm going to go out in the street and do what I need to do to help to take care of my family and help take care of my mother. And that okay? enables somebody like Lonnie Franklin like to Lonnie, prey on yeah. young people. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of the things that might seem quite shocking talking to an audience in Santa Monica, honestly, because of the devastation, is quite normal. You know, somebody is dealing in stolen cars. Somebody could get your stuff, you know, and you don't ask any questions. I mean, when you have a community so devastated with mm -hmm. so few resources and people who are considered like the bottom layer, kind of like a throwaway population, a population of people who have been criminalized, which I think we can't forget either because a lot right. of serial murders mm -hmm. start with sex workers because it is a vulnerable population who are criminalized. People know that. Know humans involved. So Nick's film is very much part of a national context because it really shows a slice of mm -hmm. a community that most people would like to forget about, even among the black middle class, that they really don't exist. But they do in South LA. They do in Ferguson. They do in Staten mm -hmm. Island. They do in Bedford-Stuyvesant. This is a national story. Yeah, it's all the same reflected. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Serial, a pocket of serial killers of black women in Cleveland, Ohio, the mm -hmm. same place where Tamir Rice was shot. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the uh, people that you interviewed, Nick, is a friend of uh, Lonnie Franklin's named Jerry, who mm. admitted to you on camera that Lonnie Franklin would torture women yep. in front of him. And at the time you filmed him, the police hadn't even interviewed him. Mm. This is a man, and Lonnie also admits that he uh, had been convicted of prior crimes, his DNA should have been in the system. I know there was an issue around a proposition and, and, and people's privacy rights with DNA. Why did it take so long? Why, why were the police not interviewing the same people that you were interviewing? Maybe they have in the time since. <laughs> why, has, why, why was his DNA not in the system? And, and why did it take so long to even authorize looking for the DNA of one of his family members? Eventually, it was his own son's well, DNA. Well, when, when actually, I, there was a big screening of the film at the Egyptian mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, and the whole a task theater. force came along to see the film. And, and this is the police task force. This is yes. the police LAPD. task force, yeah. And afterwards I said, you know, I can't believe that you haven't talked to Jerry. I mean, Jerry said he knew half of the 180 women that were found. You know, Lonnie Franklin photos. took pictures mm -hmm. of he all the photos, women that he was right. with. 180 of these pictures were found at Lonnie's house. Jerry said he knew half of those women because he went out with Lonnie every night picking up women. Yet the police still have not talked to him, and they still haven't talked to him. I mean, as of two wow. weeks ago, the police had still not talked to Jerry. And I said, how is this possible? And very lamely, the, de the main detective said, well, Jerry wouldn't talk to us. So oh. <laughs> kind of like, what's the point? I mean, They couldn't subpoena him? It is so lame <laughs> yeah. and ridiculous. You just think, well, what do you have to do? It's... Uh, so I think there's just there is no pressure on them to get to the bottom of it. It's much more convenient to say, well, all the victims are probably in landfill somewhere. Uh, there doesn't seem, yeah. you know, if there seems to be no real need to get some kind of closure. Yeah, and the pre-trial has been going on for the for last four, four years, years right. right now. The family members are getting increasingly frustrated yeah. uh, because there's now talk about maybe even go continuing the pre-trial process for another year. Mm. Why and is that? The defense attorney, yeah. I understand, is stalling because he wants now to have all like 900 pieces of evidence removed from Franklin's house to be photographed. So there's definitely stalling uh, tactics. Now, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, how strong, Margaret, is the feeling in South LA of the LAPD having botched this investigation? And at the press conference when he was finally arrested, after he was arrested, it seemed as though the LAPD really tried to rewrite the history with Mayor, <laughs> then Mayor Villaraigosa. I'm paraphrasing, saying something like, this is 25 years of diligent and dedicated police work, which uh, you then I think tried to correct the record, right. <laughs> uninvited. But uh, yeah. but how deep is this feeling in South LA that we are a community that's been ignored? Because if we were, if this was white women in Westwood, it would have been a whole different story. Everybody knows, Everyone that. knows that. You just ask anybody, and they will definitely tell you that. And and with the press conference you referred to, I mean, it was really outrageous. And I I don't think the police chief had anybody in public take the mic from him in that way. They were all you know quite stunned. But people in the community <laughs> were really glad Only that you, that Margaret. happened. <laughs> right. We're really glad that that happened because there has to be some kind of accountability. And Sonali, I can't uh, tell you the trouble that we have had for decades now getting people to pay some attention. I mean, even people who would. I, I also think there's some sexism involved in this, of frankly, course. because I do think that if this was 20 or two, we suspect now as many as 200, a mini genocide, black men who were killed, the Reverend Al Sharpton, the civil rights leaders, they all would be down here. But actually, I had one of the leaders say to me, Margaret, there's a moral issue involved. And I said, yes, the moral issue is that women are being killed. He meant the moral issue was that this particular woman who was found down from his church was a sex worker. So because this they is what were, we're sex workers, against. and not all of them, some were. Yeah. Uh, or and, crack. Or Caught addicted up in the to, yeah, addicted to drugs. So yeah, throwaway so, people. Right, no humans involved. Um, mm -hmm. Finally, Nick Broomfield, what has the reaction to your film been so far? Congratulations on being shortlisted mm -hmm. for best documentary at the Oscars. Uh, where is it heading? I know people in Southern California I mentioned can catch it at the Lumley Playhouse this week through next Wednesday. What about people around the rest of the country? Well, I think you know we're talking about having a screening in Ferguson. Um, it's going to be in New York later on this month. Um, I'm getting it out there as much as I can. There are a number of local screenings around L.A. I think we've got to get a dialogue going between the city council, who need to recognize that they have a real crisis on their hands here with the rest of uh, with South Central. So I think those channels need to be opened up. And I think there needs to be a sort of, na this needs to be part of the national debate. We need to get yeah. an internal inqu an inquiry going there as to how this was possible. And, and a memorial, a permanent memorial for the victims, right. which the Black Coalition is working on right now. And of course, it'll be at HBO. Right. HBO will so be people will going be out in, in HBO, I mean, I think quite soon, so that it's m part of the national debate. Again, the name of the film is Tales of the Grim Sleeper. It's director Nick Broomfield and uh, one of the very prominent people featured in the film, a familiar voice to our KPFK listeners, Margaret Prescott. She is the founder of uh, the uh, one of the main organizations fighting for justice, the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders. I want to thank the two of you very much for joining us, and best thank of luck you, to Sonali. you. Thank, thank you, Sonali. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.
This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. As we learn more and more about police violence toward and indifference against communities of color, we turn now to John A. Powell. He's a professor of law and of African American studies and ethnic studies at the University of California, Berkeley, who's taught at numerous law schools, including Harvard and Columbia University. Mr. Powell is the executive director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, an expert in civil rights and civil civil liberties. He's written extensively on structural racism, racial justice, and poverty in the U.S., South Africa, and Brazil. His books include In Pursuit of a Dream Deferred and The Rights of Racial Minorities, the basic ACLU guide to racial minority rights. His newest book is called Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Concepts of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society. Just a month ago, John Powell spoke at an event in Berkeley organized by KPFA Pacifica Radio, and we want to play an excerpt of his speech today, which you can get by calling 1-877-378-8669 anytime this hour and making a $75 pledge. You can also go to freespeech.org. Here is John A. Powell. If you think about the formation of the country at the beginning of the Constitution, we had Congress divided into two sections, not Democrats and Republicans. One half were for those who supported slavery. The other half was for those who opposed it. That was the divide in the country up to the Civil War. The most pressing question in terms of political filter was, are you for or against slavery? And every institution that was brought into being prior to the Civil War had to actually go through that crucible which means that all of our deep institutional groundings were heavily racialized. So think of something like the Electoral College, which we live with today. The Electoral College was in part a racialized system. We have a system where the South is gonna come into the Union. They wanna make sure that they have parity with the North. They don't have as many people. So they come up with this ingenious plan. We are gonna count the slaves who everybody knows is not really people, we're gonna count them for the purpose of adding to our leisure the number of people in our state. It's called the three-fifths clause. And some people get confused and they say, slaves were only considered three-fifths of a person. Slaves were not considered a person at all. It was the slave master that actually was enhanced by counting the slave, not the slave. And it created relative parity between the North and South. And so the first several presidents, including Jefferson, would not have won without the three-fifths clause. The three-fifths clause stacked the deck in favor of the South and in using the institution of slavery to do that. Now I could do this with all the institutions and this has actually been done uh, by two authors, a number of authors, but Alicina and Glazer in a book called Fighting Poverty in the United States in Europe, A World of Difference. And they talk about American exceptionalism. What actually produced that exceptionalism? How does that exceptionalism actually express itself? And one of the things they say is that when you look at the exceptionalism, not just in terms of our stingy welfare program, not just our exceptionalism in, t in terms of our possessive individualism, not just our exceptionalism in terms of our racial brawling, but our exceptionalism in terms of our institutions themselves, states' rights, federalism, winner takes all, the role of the Supreme Court. They say all of these can only be understood through the lens of race. Now this is important because when we think of race, we think about oftentimes we default to when we talk about race, we're talking about black people. Maybe we're talking about Latinos, maybe we're talking about Native Americans or Asians, but mainly we're talking about black people when we say race. That's the thought. We say race, people think black people. And you always get the question, or I always get the question, why are we even talking about race anymore? Aren't we beyond that? Uh, we don't have to see race, and, and now there are all these people who are not black. Uh, they're not white, but they're not black, so can we talk about something else? It's not simply a question of conversation. If you look at our institutional design, 
how we structure our institutions, how our institutions are different than any other country on the planet. You simply can't understand it without understanding the race. So when we talk about race, we're not talking about what black people get. You all are affected by the Electoral College, everyone in here. It's a racialized system. So let me give you a more recent example of that. There's a book by Ira Katz Nelson, and those of you who are academics will recognize him as a heavyweight. He's a very careful social scientist. And some of you, like my friend Connie Heller, have struggled through 700 pages of his books as he talks about fear itself and how fear helped frame our culture and institutions in some fundamental ways that all of us live with. So he says that there are three primary fears at the time. He talked about war, he talked about the economy, but he also talked about the fear in terms of race. And he says this fear helped shape everything from the 1930s on. So what's an example of that? In the 1930s, during the Great Depression and then during the Marshall Plan, the government was dealing with high unemployment. It decided to create jobs. We all know the Public Works Program. It literally created thousands of jobs. It built roads, it built bridges, and it put America back to work. But then something happened. The South was concerned because the Public Works Program didn't adhere to Jim Crow. It didn't adhere to the idea that whites always have to be on top. And so the South basically said, you can never do that again. The government can never be in the business of actually creating jobs. It redefined the role of government. John A. Powell is a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley. He gave this wide-ranging hour-long speech just a month ago. In fact, it was the day after the midterm elections. And remember, the protests in Ferguson had broken out starting in the summer when Mike Brown was killed by Darren Wilson. And since then, the movement has only grown. And if you want an understanding, a greater context for what we're seeing around the country, as well as a context for what we heard in the first part of our program. Um, please call us right now at 877-378-8669, 877-378-8669, or go to freespeech.org. We want you to have a copy of this entire speech in your hand, not just snippets on your television, but in your hand on a DVD for a $75 pledge at freespeech.org or 877-378-8669. 8669 will send you the speech. Now, you can up that donation. Instead of $75, maybe you don't want the DVD, maybe you really just want to support Free Speech TV because we provide a platform for people like John A. Powell. You can pledge $120 for the Black Lives Matters Uprising t-shirt and the Uprising coffee mug. A beautiful black t-shirt that you can see on your screen with the white lettering Black Lives Matter a rallying cry for this new movement we're seeing. On the back of the t-shirt is Uprising's logo, as is on the coffee mug that's pictured. You can get both of these for a pledge of $120. Now, you can even pledge $150 and get it all. Get the Black Lives Matters t-shirt, the coffee mug, and the DVD of John A. Powell. So $120 for the t-shirt and the coffee mug, $150 just another $30 and we'll throw in the DVD. All you have to do is call in 877-378-8669 or go to freespeech.org, 877-378-8669, freespeech.org. Call the number on your screen or go to the website on your screen and make your pledges. You can pledge at the 75, 120, $150 level, whatever level you can donate. That contribution goes towards keeping us on the air. Uprising is the newest program on Free Speech TV. We are so thrilled to be here to be able to reach you, and we want to be able to pull our weight alongside the other programs on Free Speech TV, like Democracy Now!, and Tom Hartman Show, and many, many other wonderful shows, and say, look, our program, too, can help raise the money to keep Free Speech TV on the air. 877-378-8669 or freespeech.org is the website. An incredible, wide-ranging, powerful speech by John A. Powell tracing the history of the United States and how uh, it, it was essentially founded, institutions like Social Security founded in order to disempower people of color, uh, institutions like 
the electoral college, the concept of corporations being treated as people, taking advantage of the Constitution in order to empower corporations. I mean, all of this part of our history that we don't know enough about, putting a context on these movements that we're seeing around the country today. 877-378-8669 or freespeech.org for $75 pledge, the DVD for $120, the T-shirt and the mug for $150. You get the DVD, the mug and the T-shirt, get it all for $150 pledge. Again, 877-378-8669 or freespeech.org. The speech by John A. Powell on DVD, the T-shirt that has Black Lives Matter, this new rallying cry uh, that really is uh, reflecting a call that is as old as the country itself, and a coffee mug that says Uprising with Sonali on it, all three for $150 pledge. I want to turn back to John A. Powell. Here's another excerpt of this powerful speech, brand new, exclusively available. It's available very few places. Free Speech TV and Pacifica are the only places you can get it. Get it right now through Free Speech TV. Here's Mr. Powell. Corporations in their first expression were not separate from the state. They were part of the state. And they could only be engaged in activity that the state allowed. As they started pulling away from the state, they, they got into this big contest with the state. And they were able to enlist the Republican Party as their benefactor. And so a strategy became, how do you actually protect corporations, this artificial being, excuse me, that lasts forever? And what they did, they started asserting the corporations deserve the protections of people. And the first big case on that was the Dartmouth College case. The next really big case was Dred Scott. And all of you, even those of you who don't study or practice law, will have heard of Dred Scott. But very few will realize that Dred Scott was a corporate case. The fight was, are corporations citizens for the purpose of diversity jurisdiction, which means they can go into federal court? And the South was very upset with that. They said, if you grant them the right of citizenship, you have to grant it to blacks, and that'll destroy the institution of slavery. And so Taney came up with this ingenious plan, which was, what if we create a super subordinate category for blacks so then we can actually extend a hand to corporations. So we're going to say that we don't have to worry about blacks, whether they're free or enslaved. They can never, never be part of the polity because they are not people. They are not human. They can never be members of our society. Now, can we allow corporations in? That was the move he made. And the court continues to build on that. And so what you see in the courts is that whenever we expand the rights of corporations, we contract the rights of people, and particularly the most marginal people. Those two things go together. So when you think about Citizens United, you also have to think about the voting rights cases. They go hand in hand. So a court that's solicitous to corporations are almost always hostile to citizens. And by extension, almost always hostile to democracy. So we come up to the 1930s. And one of the justices know that of the hundreds of cases that have come using the Civil War amendments, which were the amendments designed to actually bring blacks into the polity, to overturn Dred Scott, to say, yes, blacks are people, the court said, Almost all the cases using these Civil War amendments have been used on behalf of corporations, and blacks have been locked out. This was 1937. And we're going to change that. We're going to say, now you can actually challenge corporations, and the court has a special role to protect marginalized populations. That's what the court should be doing. That's what the court should have been doing all the time. And they had a special phrase for it. They call them discrete and insular minorities groups who don't have political power. They should be protected by the court, uh, not corporations. And it's that decision and those series of decisions that actually was the first expression of the civil rights movement, the first expression of starting to actually change the structures and invite people in. 
So then we come up to the New Deal, which actually creates a different structure, a new structure, and invites more and more people in. But the South, again, is fighting this. Now, in, in terms of understanding this country and understanding what happened yesterday, you have to realize we've never had, certainly not since the Civil War, a two-party system. We've had a three-party system. We've had the Democrats, we've had the Republicans, and we've had the South. And the South has been, always been organized around race. They've always been organized around dominating racial hierarchy. And they will align themselves for a period of time with the Democrats. We had a special word for them. We call them Dixiecrats because we're saying they're different than other Democrats. Their number one issue, their defining issue, is an issue around race. And they will say to Roosevelt, whomever, we will work with you, but only if you make race a central part of every piece of legislation that comes out of Congress. And so the New Deal was a great deal if you were white. It wasn't such a good deal if you're black. It wasn't even such a good deal if you're a white woman. And so you had all of this legislation designed to challenge corporations, but it could only be done if it was only for whites. So think of something like Social Security. Social Security had a number of exceptions. It covered all the people working, except if you were a farm worker, if you were a domestic worker, or if you were a stay-at-home mom. And with those exceptions, it knocked out virtually all Latinos, all blacks, and all women. But it didn't even stop there. It also said, in case we miss somebody, we can let the states administer this program itself. So the states could actually catch anyone who might filter through. So this program that created Middle America was a program for a certain group of people that was incredibly racially coded. John A. Powell laying out an incredible history, a little known history, if you want the DVD of his entire speech, unedited, without us playing little snippets from it. Call us right now at 877-378-8669, 877-378-8669, or go to freespeech.org in order for a $75 pledge, the DVD of John A. Powell. It's so important that we hear from you. We are in the middle of the Free Speech TV Winter Fund Drive. We need to be able to raise the money to keep this very important broadcasting outlet on the air. We are not corporate sponsored. We're sponsored by you. We are sponsored by our viewers. And if you don't come through for us, well, we don't exist anymore. So it's crucial that you step up to the plate and you say, yes, I want more information like this. You don't get this kind of historical context very many places, particularly in the media landscape. That's why Free Speech TV and Uprising are so important. Please call 877-378-8669 or go to freespeech.org. It's just a $75 pledge for this more than hour long DVD with Q&A at the end, by the way, a very interesting and exciting exchange between the audience and Mr. Powell. If you'd like to up your pledge and make it a $150 pledge, we will send you the DVD along with the Black Lives Matter t-shirt and the coffee mug that has Uprising's logo on it. This is our pack that we are most uh, interested in you getting. Why? Because not only is the donation level a little bit higher, but you get a lot for a small amount of money. I know 150 sounds like a lot, but you're getting a lot. You're getting a DVD that you really can't find too many places. It's a Pacifica exclusive that we're sharing with Free Speech TV. And the Black Lives Matter t-shirt that you can proudly wear. It's going to have Uprising's logo on the back and you get the coffee mug. Now, you can just get the t-shirt and the coffee mug by themselves for a $120 pledge. Now, that just amounts to $10 a month. And all you do is call 877-378-8669, 877-378-8669, or go to freespeech.org. For the cost of probably what it would cost you to buy 
coffee every day or definitely less than what it would cost you to subscribe to cable, uh, you can get free speech TV for a very, very small amount of money. And when I say you can get free speech TV, of course, it comes with your cable subscription if you get it on DirecTV and Dish Network. But really, this is a, a network that doesn't rely on corporate sponsors. So the other channels, you get those with ads. Free speech TV, we ask you to pay for it because it keeps us honest. 877-378-8669 is the number to go call or go to freespeech.org for a $75 pledge, the DVD of John A. Powell. For a $120 pledge, the T-shirt and the mug. For a $150 pledge, get it all. The DVD, the T-shirt, and the mug. And that's incredible because 120 gives you the T-shirt and a mug. You just up it with an extra $30 and we'll give you the $75 DVD for the $150 pack. If you can't keep track of everything we've been telling you, it doesn't matter. Just call the number and ask them what you would like, to, what you can get for the amount that you'd like to pledge, whether it is 75, 120, or 150, and our phone answers will explain it to you. 877-378-8669, or simply go shopping on freespeech.org. We don't like to encourage con mindless consumerism, but we think this would be mindful consumerism because your consumerism in this case, and of course these are donations, will go toward keeping free speech TV on the air. 877-378. 8669 or freespeech.org. Let's turn back for one last excerpt, if we can fit it in, in the last few minutes of our program of John A. Powell speaking just about a month ago. Now, I said race continues to change. So the New Deal and the Marshall Plan, by creating this social space, for the first time the United States had social welfare in a serious way, it created a new identity, a new white identity. The whites traded in their ethnic identity, Irish American, Italian American, German American, for a new identity called white Americans. And in trading that in, it wasn't just an idea. It's never just an idea. It's like, how do you actualize that? How do you operationalize that? And the way they did it was they created something called the suburbs. The suburbs was the new space that the new white Americans would live in. So we get a new identity in the 1940s and 50s, a new white identity. But at the same time, the government was very clear, this is not for blacks. So it drew a hard line. So it also created a new black identity. And we live with that until the 1960s. And in the 1960s, something happened. We had a powerful expression of the civil rights movement. And that movement basically said, we too, blacks, Native Americans, Latinos, and then later women. We too should be part of society. We too are people. We too want to be part of the social welfare system. And Johnson heard that call. And he said, yes, the civil, the, excuse me, the New Deal was flawed because it was a racialized movement. We should actually build a society that's fair and inclusive. So he signed a Civil Rights Act in 1964, and he signed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. But in signing it, he said, I've just given the Republicans the South for at least a generation. And the Republicans said, thank you, we'll take it. And out of that came something called the Southern Strategy, which was, how do you realign the South? And the South hated Republicans because they had engaged in the War of Aggression, which is what they called the, Civil, the Civil, Civil War. It was the War of Aggression against the South. So they hated Republicans. And the only thing they hated more than Republicans were blacks. And as, as Johnson welcomed blacks into the polity, that third party shift alliance, and it went to the Republicans. So we used to have the solid South for Democrats, now we have the solid South for Republicans. But here's the deal. The Republicans said, the solid South said, we'll join the Republican Party under one condition. What's that? You have to have an extremely racialized set of activity. That's our issue. That's our number one issue. If you're willing to align on that, we can make common cause. And the Republican Party said, well, you know what? 
our number one issue is not race. Our number one issue is big business. Our number one issue is the 1%. So we can figure out a way of marrying a neoliberal agenda and a racial agenda, we have a deal. Now, you will not get this kind of analysis anywhere else but on Free Speech TV. So John A. Powell, whom you've just been watching speaking, a professor of law and of ethnic studies and African American studies at University of California, Berkeley, author of a number of books speaking just a month ago at KPFA in Berkeley. You can get a copy of the speech right now. We're nearly out of time, folks. Just minutes left in the hour. All you have to do is call 877-378-8669 or go to freespeech.org. It's on your screen. Dial that number or go to that website. For a $75 pledge, you get the DVD. For a hundred and twenty dollar pledge you get the black lives matter t-shirt and the coffee mug for 150 you get all three so all three items on your screen right now the dvd the t-shirt and the mug for a pledge of 150 dollars at 877-378-8669 or go to freespeech.org very important that we hear from you we want to be able to raise as much money as possible for free speech tv and say to free speech tv look how much your viewers appreciate your newest program we're so grateful to be here this is such an important outlet reaching so many of you around the country for the first time and you know we know that this is a very very uh, difficult time for many of you we appreciate every dollar you can donate it's the end of the year make your end of the year giving to free speech tv right now 877-378-8669 or freespeech.org the speech is wide ranging it's more than an hour long it's got q a you can't get it anywhere else it's exclusive to pacifica and free speech tv and we want you to have a copy of it so that you can have conversations with your neighbors and your friends about the issue of race and the history of the united states at this moment in time when the movement is breaking out all over the country about an issue that has been an issue for so long, it's as old as the United States itself. 877-378-8669 is the number, or go to freespeech.org for $75 pledge, the DVD. For $120, the book, uh, rather the T-shirt and the coffee mug. For $150, the DVD, the coffee mug, and the T-shirt. You get it all for a pledge of just $150. We are out of time, folks. Please keep those calls coming in, and please go to the website at freespeech.org. Dot org. Again, you can get the book, uh, rather the DVD, not the book, the DVD, the T-shirt, and the coffee mug for a $150 pledge. This is Uprising. Bipasha Shom is our producer and our program director. Anna Buss is our media intern. Camilo Ramirez and Christian Beck are our production interns. Alexander Hobbs is our technical director. Teddy Robinson and Jonathan Alexander are our audio engineers. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprising with sonali.com. Our theme music is by Quetzal. I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host and executive producer of Uprising. See you next week.